Next on Current News, a house fire in Richmond Hill takes the lives of a Catholic schoolgirl and her hardworking mom. Tonight, the Brooklyn Diocese is mourning the tragedy. Massive protests in Puerto Rico. Thousands are demanding the island's governor quit his job. Pope Francis is taking action on the crisis in war-torn Syria. He's sending a message directly to Bashar al-Assad. Plus, the wild scene in Hong Kong when a mob attacks commuters at a train station. The news starts right now. The fire raged for more than an hour in the Richmond Hill home of seven-year-old Guadalupe Perez and her mom, Sylvia. The flames moved quickly, killing them and badly injuring two of Sylvia's teenage sons. Good evening, I'm Michelle Powers. Tonight, the blaze is being blamed on a damaged air conditioner cord, and fire officials are reporting that there was no working smoke alarm in the two-story house. At this hour, a Queens church is rallying around the family. Kearns News' Tim Harfman is standing by at the scene of the tragedy. Tim. Michelle, you can still smell the charred debris from what's left of this two-family house. Uh, this, set, this heartbreaking story not only affecting this Richmond Hill community, but one Queens Parish is also mourning the loss. Bishop Octavio Cisneros places flowers outside Holy Child Jesus Catholic Academy to remember Guadalupe Perez and her mother, Silvia Umana, who died in a house fire Sunday morning. They were part of the parish. Guadalupe was a student at the academy. How could this be? Um, the parish is in mourning and we're all shocked. According to the FDNY, a damaged air conditioner cord caused the two alarm fire in this Richmond Hill, Queens home. Fire officials believe it was an accident and also note there were no working smoke detectors in the house. This was the scene Sunday morning as firefighters performed CPR on Sylvia, a 51-year-old single mother from El Salvador. Outside the burning home, a medical crew placed her on a stretcher, trying to resuscitate her. First responders also tried to save seven-year-old Guadalupe, performing CPR in the ambulance. Both frantic efforts failed. We know she's with the Lord. Uh, Guadalupe was in first grade, entering second grade. Uh, she was eventually being prepared for First Holy Communion. She's one of those whom God has said, let the children come to me. Sylvia's two sons, 19-year-old Gilbert and 15-year-old Gabriel, sustained injuries. According to the NYPD, Gilbert was transported to Jamaica Hospital, then transferred to Cornell Hospital. He is in critical condition. Gabriel was transported to King County Hospital and is in stable condition. The 15-year-old is also a former Catholic Academy student. Bishop Cisnero says the parish is praying for the teens. Richmond Hill resident Andre Scott remembers seeing a happy Guadalupe outside her home. Every time I seen a little girl, she was always playing, always running up and down the block. She would run to like, wait, basically you got the yellow tape at. She would run back and forth to the corner and that's about it. Now there's a memorial on the steps of Holy Child Jesus, including flowers, purple and black bunting, and a picture of Guadalupe. Every single student uh, counts. Every single person in our school is a member of a family, and we want her to be part of this family in our prayers and as we offer her to Almighty God. The principal of Holy Child Jesus Catholic Academy set up a donation page for people to help the family. Go online to GoFundMe.com and search Guadalupe Perez backslash Sylvia Umana Memorial Fund. So far, they have raised over $6,000. In Richmond Hill, Queens, Tim Harfman, Currents News. Michelle, back to you. Tim, a tragic story. Have funeral arrangements been yet announced? Since the last time we checked, no, but we do know there will be a meeting tomorrow night at Holy Child Jesus Catholic Academy so parents can understand how to talk to their children about loss and then a memorial mass will follow, celebrated by Bishop Octavio Cisneros. Michelle. 
Thank you, Tim. Con Ed is reporting the power is back on for most residents of Brooklyn. More than 50,000 customers lost electricity last night after the utility company deliberately shut off power to make repairs. The hardest hit area was in southeast Brooklyn. Late today, Con Ed said it had restored service to mostly everyone. Both Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Andrew Cuomo blasted Con Ed, saying it should have been better prepared for the weekend's hot weather. Hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans filling the streets of San Juan today, one of the largest protests in the U.S. territory's history. The massive gathering comes a day after the island's governor, Ricardo Rosello, said he would not step down over a leaked online chat in which he and top eggs exchanged obscenity-laced messages. Some even included insults about victims of the deadly 2017 Hurricane Maria. Omar Jimenez has the latest from San Juan. It's a scene some are describing as unprecedented. Thousands of Puerto Ricans marching in the streets and demanding their governor's resignation. At the heart of these demonstrations are leaked messages between Governor Ricardo Rosseo and his inner circle, many of them profanity-laced, homophobic, and misogynistic in nature. At one point, Roseo responded to a message that threatened to shoot San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz by saying, quote, you'd be doing me a grand favor. The crimes committed by the governor are so horrendous that it cannot wait. So it it's impeachment wait. or it's just... It, it is impeachment. But Roseo isn't backing down. He's apologized and says he won't run for re-election next year, but has also said he plans to continue serving as governor. I need to work beyond politics uh, so that we can address some of the long-standing problems uh, of, of corruption here in Puerto Rico and fix that problem. But as protests are close to entering a second week... Everyone is telling Ricky that the game is over. ...and calls for Roseo's impeachment grow, he may not get that opportunity. Omar Jimenez, Currents News. Pope Francis is taking on the crisis in Syria, and this morning he called on the country's ruler to better protect his people. The Vatican hand-delivered a letter today to the president of war-torn Syria, Bashar al-Assad. It comes from the Holy Father and calls for an end to, quote, the humanitarian catastrophe in the country. Pope Francis is also asking for the safe return of millions of people displaced by years of fighting. At least 18 people were killed only yesterday from a government attack on Idlib province. President Trump met this afternoon with Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan as the two nations work to mend strained relations. Tensions have been high since the U.S. cut off $300 million in military aid to Pakistan. The White House accusing the country of not doing enough to combat terrorism. Before going into closed door meetings, the two leaders spoke about working together. Dozens of people are in the hospital tonight after a mob armed with clubs and sticks attacked commuters at a suburban train station in Hong Kong. The violence erupting after a day of pro-democracy protests against a bill that would permit extraditions to mainland China. The attackers are suspected of being backers of Beijing's communist government. Meanwhile, in Honduras, immigrants trying to enter the United States are being returned by the busload each day from Mexico. But some of those sent back say they remain undeterred and will head north again once they get the chance. They return by the busload. This is one of about a dozen entering Honduras each day, carrying men, women and children whose hopes of reaching the U.S. were cut short in Mexico where they were stopped and forced to come home. It's really difficult. I can't lie to you. I don't recommend it. All the centers are full in the city where I was in Mexico. I was there and got deported. These are some of the tens of thousands still desperately trying to enter the U.S. President Trump is pressuring Mexico. If Mexico does a great job, then you're not going to have very many people coming up. If they don't, then we have phase two. Phase two is very tough. 
with a 45-day deadline. Mexico has appeared eager to comply with Trump's demands, dramatically increasing deportations of Central Americans. In Honduras alone, nearly 40,000 have been returned from Mexico since the start of the year, of whom 14,000 were unaccompanied minors. Some are warning others against attempting the same journey. In Mexico, they don't want to give us shelter or anything. There's no point of going there. There's no water. They don't want to give us food, nothing. It's very difficult. I recommend people stay put. But many are undeterred, feeling they have little left to lose. The poverty here, that's why we look for a better future for our families. We are fallen but not defeated. God willing, we will try it again within a couple of days. Recently, murder rates, gang violence, and unemployment have all soared in Honduras, leaving the choice to remain in the country a difficult one for many. New York Senator Chuck Schumer led a group of Democrat senators on a tour of a migrant detention facilities at the Texas border on Friday. He said he found most to be inhumane, except for one. We did see one good place run by Catholic Charities and Sister Norma, where the people were treated well, where they had a uh, path where they could be adjudicated properly and given a, given a shot, given a fair shot. But the rest of the facilities weren't close to that. Schumer said if the White House changed policies, there could be more facilities like Catholic Charities. The nation is paying its final respects to late Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. The current justices formed an honor guard around the casket of Justice Stevens this morning. The public is also being allowed into the court's grand hall to say goodbye. Justice Stevens served on the high court for 35 years. Tomorrow he will be laid to rest at Arlington National, National Cemetery. First responders are also heading to the nation's capital. They hope to witness the vote on the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. That's expected tomorrow in the Senate. If passed and signed by the president, it would extend the fund created after the attacks through 2092, essentially making it permanent. Last week, Republican Senator Rand Paul blocked a vote on the bill, citing the cost. There's a lot more news headed your way. I'm Tim Harfman in Jamaica, Queens, where thousands of teenagers from across the country gather at St. John's University to strengthen their relationship with Christ. That story is coming up. The famous Giulio is lifted into the air, but there was an unexpected delay. And the Pope talks about a man on the moon. As most New Yorkers tried to beat the heat this weekend, a more than century old tradition took to the skies of Williamsburg. The old timers lift still took place this past Sunday at the Giglio Festival, though at a later time due to the extreme heat. Because of that, yesterday's beautiful sunset backlit the four ton tower as it was danced through the streets. The ceremony is part of the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Thousands of teens from across the country traveled to St. John's University this weekend, the huge event meant to encourage them to encounter Christ at a time when they could be questioning their faith. Once again, Currents News' Tim Hoffman reports. An arena packed not for a sporting event, but prayer. It's Steubenville, NYC, a conference designed to deepen relationships with Christ. About 2,000 teenagers and young adults from across the country spending the weekend at St. John's University. They were all like, let's go to New York. This group traveling over 4,000 miles from Alaska says the event makes them feel like they belong to the Universal Church. It's just like such a fulfilling moment. You come here and you kind of get to just let everything out. You don't feel really pressured and you don't feel like anxious that everybody's going to be looking at you because you know that everyone around you is feeling the same thing that you are. The conference is a collaboration between the Brooklyn Diocese, Rockville Center Diocese, Archdiocese of New York, the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and Life Team, a movement to encounter Christ. Father Rick Martinetti is one of the weekend's guest speakers. We come to the table of the Lord, he nourishes us, and then we have to go forward and find where we can make a difference in the world. So instead of staying outside criticizing the church, I encourage them, be a part of it and use your gifts to make it better. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio celebrates Sunday's closing mass. 
telling the congregation he chose to wear vestments from this year's World Youth Day with Pope Francis, the international gathering of young people in Panama. When they come together and see other people of their same age that have faith, that encourages them. That's what the church is about. We encourage one another. We just don't go to God alone. We go as a community of faith. Encouraging one another at a time when teens from Brooklyn and Queens say their Catholic faith could be challenging. It's honestly beautiful because you would think that youth does, like, does not, wants nothing to do with God and it's really amazing to see it. young people worship God. Well, sometimes you question your faith and coming here actually like helped me like, think about my faith and actually like made me feel closer to God and um, actually knowing that I do belong and actually, it made me feel good and it was a good experience. They say they're now inspired to go out and strengthen the future of the church. In Jamaica, Queens, Tim Harfman, Currents News. New York State Assemblywoman Nicole Meliotakis just got back from a trip to the Holy Land, the journey taking place at a troubled time for the region. She joins us now to talk about her experience. Hi, hi, Nicole. Now, you're a Greek Orthodox Christian. Describe to me about the Holy Land. What did you see? What did you experience? Well, it was a, it was a very special visit. It was a consolidated visit. It was a three-day visit, so it was very short. Um, but I did, I did go with the National Council of uh, Young Israels, a, a prominent Jewish organization uh, that has a large presence here in New York. Um, and, and we were able to visit multiple sites, meet with different government officials, um, including the ambassador, or deputy ambassador uh, to Israel, um, but some uh, ministers, uh, past, uh, present, and future within the Israeli government. And it was very interesting uh, just to learn more, um, both historical and current events. And for me, uh, in particular, as a Christian uh, of Greek Orthodox faith, it was very um, special and it felt uh, I was very much blessed to be able to go and pray at the the sites um, you know historical biblical sites the birthplace of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem and the um, the Holy Sepulchre which is in Jerusalem and is the site of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection all right perfect so three days all jam-packed what about the long-term prospects for Christianity in the Middle East and across the region the persecution of the faithful is on the rise. What did you see while you were in Israel? Well, one of the things that uh, we were able to learn uh, firsthand speaking to uh, individuals that are living there and are of Christian faith um, was that you know they're seeing they're seeing the population fleeing, right? They're they're yeah. seeing particularly you know in the West Bank of Bethlehem where it was always was a very prominent Christian population. Uh, in fact, the site of Jesus Christ's uh, birth in, in Bethlehem, uh, the church that is built upon it, the Church of the Nativity, is split up into three different churches and it, it's controlled pieces of, of Greek Orthodox faith as well as the Armenian Apostolic and the Roman Catholic. Um, they have seen the numbers drop tremendously from roughly 85% uh, uh, Christian population down to uh, you know, in the teens, uh, and so that is, uh, I think, un it's unfortunate, and it's important for us as elected officials to speak up and speak out, condemn it, and fight back to end it. Um, and that's that's really, I think, you know, one of the reasons why I, I believe all elected officials should visit the Holy Land um, and see firsthand what is happening there. We see anti-Semitism on the rise in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. What should people here be doing to reduce these attacks? Well, I, I think the, the one of the biggest things is that we need to show each other love. We need to show each other the, the compassion and respect um, that this is a country uh, that respects all religions. And, and unfortunately here in Brooklyn, uh, we have seen you know hate attacks on the Muslim community, on the Christian community, on uh, the, the Jewish community, um, and, and within the Christian community, the Greek Orthodox Church, the uh, Catholic Church. So it is something un that's a very unfortunate, and it has risen over the last a couple of years. Matter of fact, hate crimes overall have risen right. in New York State, and um, those that are anti-Semitic are uh, have doubled over the past year. I think it's um, it's it's really you know parents talking to their children about loving each other regardless of what our differences are. Um, I think there's also a, a real danger um, with some of the rhetoric that we're hearing from elected officials. You know when, when you when, uh, relating to anti-Semitism, it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to condemn it and condemn it forcefully. Assemblywoman Nicole Meliotakis, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. 
The U.S. marked the anniversary of a giant leap for mankind this weekend. Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong took his small step onto the moon 50 years ago. Now Pope Francis is saying the feat should inspire us. Possa il ricordo di quel grande passo per l'umanità accendere il desiderio di progredire insieme verso traguardi ancora maggiori, più dignità ai deboli, più giustizia tra i popoli, più futuro per la nostra casa comune. The Holy Father was 32 when the moon landing happened, a simple Jesuit priest back then. Still to come on Current News, the mystery at the Vatican surrounding the disappearance of a young girl takes a new twist. The Pope's Radio, a look at the station that has broadcasted the Pope's message around the world. And the tablet has a brand new page called Our Diocesan Family, where you can share your pictures of recent baptisms, holy communions, confirmations, marriage, all of the joyous sacraments. For more details and to submit your photos, go to thetablet.org slash Our Diocesan Family. Your picture may be published in an upcoming issue of the newspaper. We'll be right back. The plot thickens in the mystery of a young girl who disappeared in Rome. 15-year-old Emanuela Orlandi vanished without a trace almost 40 years ago. Now an update, thousands of bones believed to belong to dozens of people have been found in a chamber beneath a college next to the Vatican graveyard. The Holy See is promising a new investigation into the discovery. Helping to spread the good news and the message of the Pope is Vatican Radio. The almost century-old station started by Pope Pius XI was a way to hear the Holy Father's voice even in troubling times. Melissa Butts has more on that story. For nearly 90 years, the Vatican has had its very own radio station, otherwise known as the Pope's radio station, transmitting his messages throughout the world. 200 office workers, 40 different editions, and at least 35 languages. This is Vatican Radio. At the request of Pope Pius XI, it was created on February 12, 1931, by Guglielmo Marconi as a powerful means of communication for the future and a way to share his message. It was a great instrument to bring the Pope's voice to many countries. It also served as a free voice to get information in time of war and to share the Pope's voice and other information in the years of communism for other countries. Vatican Radio was the first international broadcasting outlet in, in the world. So the church has always been in the forefront of media, understanding that technology must be at the service of humanity. And our purpose is to spread that message of hope, which is essentially what the good news is all about, isn't it? Transmitting in each language, the radio's mission hasn't changed, yet communication within the Holy See has, and is currently in a reform process. We're bringing together nine different communications departments. It's a process. It involves people, first of all, uh, technology as well. Uh, it's, it's a complicated process. Now the radio is part of a larger team, Vatican News. It's composed of nearly 600 people in total who are working to spread the Pope's message to the world. That brings us just about to the end of this edition of Vatican and World News. Despite the changing media world, they say that radio is not dying. In fact, by 2025, they're expecting that radio listening will outbeat TV viewing, which is declining three times faster than radio. At Vatican Radio, Melissa Butts, Currents News. That is Currents News. I'm Michelle Powers. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.